right, welcome everybody. We're coming to you from Multiverse today, Multiversual, our 2020 online convention. Um, this is one of our guest of honor panels, which we're really, really excited about. And um, we'll take a second and just introduce ourselves. I'm Jesse, I'm the co-host of Glitchy Pancakes podcast and co-chair of Multiverse Convention. And I'm Rob, um, I'm a co-host of uh, Glitchy Pancakes. And I'm Allie. I am co-chair of Multiverse and producer at uh, Glitchy Pancakes. Yep. And we have our author guest of honor today, um, somebody that we were really hoping to meet in person and <laughs> fly down from Indianapolis. We did not get so lucky this year, but, you know, we are, we, uh, we'll see you next year. Uh, Maurice Broadus is originally born in London, England, but has lived in Indianapolis most of his life. Um, holds a Bachelor of Science from Purdue in Biology. So you got that science background, which is cool. Um, <laughs> spends a bulk of his time doing community development work, which is awesome. Uh, he's the author of over a dozen novels, nearly 100 short stories currently in print, including the novella Buffalo Soldier, Urban Fantasy Knights of Breton Court Trilogy, steampunk novel Pimp My Airship, which I just love that title, <laughs> um, middle grade detective novel series, The Usual Suspects, gaming work writing for Marvel superheroes, Leverage, and Firefly, ro Firefly role-playing games. Uh, he's got an upcoming space opera trilogy from Tor Books. A TV adaptation of his novella Sorcerers is coming up from AMC Networks and recently won an Indiana Authors Award. So very, very <laughs> prolific and very busy Maurice brought us. Thank you for yes, joining us. Absolutely. <laughs> now I'm exhausted just hearing that bio. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take up the, like I can take up the entire panel just reading off your intro. And that didn't even get to all of it. But, no. Uh, no. That's, uh, yeah, we really appreciate you being here. That's uh, how you've been holding up. I know it's, you're, you're, you're an active person. You like to be out and about and, and doing stuff. Right. So how are you handling this pandemic situation? Uh, you know what, here's the thing is uh, I could probably do this the rest of my life. It has been, <laughs> it's been kind of great. Uh, but I think part of that's because I, uh, like for the bulk of the, the summer, I had both my sons living with me. I had my mom living with me. Um, I converted, well not converted, but I tr started treating my porch as my, um, as my coffee shop. So my daily routine was riding on the porch. When I wasn't riding, I was visiting with neighbors or artists in the community would drop by, uh, you know, in social distance with me on the porch. And I'm just like, oh, I could, I could do this forever. I'm good. <laughs> so you're kind of, kind of doing a lot of the same stuff, but just in your, but now you get to bring everybody to you when you want and right. in the space that you want. That's okay. You're selling me on this. <laughs> you're really getting me on board with this idea. Yeah. I'm going to have to build a bigger You need porch. a billboard that says Maurice holds court. <laughs> Put it up when, when people My are my wife basically made a very similar sign and it is hanging up on the porch. Perfect. <laughs> See, it was a good idea. Smart woman. <laughs> right. Yeah, so you've had, uh, you had said in an interview recently that this is like, this last little while has felt like an entire career, like the last couple of months. So um, as, I guess as, maybe has it been helpful being able to be at home more considering you've just had so much stuff come at you like career-wise? Like, oh yeah, it's been very helpful because, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, so it, it's a double-edged sword. So I have my, my wife and my mom there, you know, it's sort of the, the support, you know, it's like, oh, I don't, you know, as I'm trying to navigate this new space that I'm in. <clears throat> and then I have, you know, uh, an 18 and a 19 year old boys who um, basically troll me on the internet. And so <laughs> they keep me very, very grounded. Anytime they, I, they even whiff that I get a, I'm starting to get a big head. They are right there to troll me. Uh, to, oh man. So oh, kids bad. are good for that, aren't they? They are oh, the yeah. best at that because they don't get, it doesn't matter. Like they're, they're, if their parent is doing really well or gets a, gets a book adapted into a show or wins an award, right. they don't care. They just want to know what's for well, dinner. So, <laughs> right. so look, so you know what, here's the worst part. So I signed that book deal with the, uh, with the tour for the space opera, right? Mm -hmm. The ink is barely dry on the con on, on the contract, and my son is like, "Wait a second! I was searching for scholarships, but Dad just signed a book deal, so I'm good." And I'm like, "Oh no, no, no! No, you don't get to just stop searching for scholarships just got signed a book deal." Also, you need to learn a little something about book deals. <laughs> right, exactly. I gave him a quick education on how that works. <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 a different look. So, what about the? You're also uh, you have AMC Networks. I know you don't know exactly which property it's going to be on, but they're adapting um, Sorcerers. I was wondering, what is it like to get that call? Like, what does it feel like to get the, or, you know, email or whatever, when they say a major media company says, we like this, we want to adapt it and put it on screen. Like, what does that feel like? Uh, I don't, there's a, <laughs> so the, the world kind of glows white and there's a vague sense that you may or may not have passed out. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, you know, it's just, it just completely numb. And then my, luckily my wife is right there to go, it's not real till we have a check to cash. That's right. That's uh, right. And, and I'm like, that is just real talk when it comes That's to dealing with Hollywood. And so I'm just like, oh, okay, you know what? That, that is true. Uh, but then the check came and then we were like, oh crap, this is really happening. Oh, oh wow. Oh, okay. Now <laughs> that's what, what makes do? it real, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's when it became real. <laughs> yeah. Well, you write in such like, uh, like we said, uh, introducing you, short stories, novellas, novels, essays, like uh, urban fantasy, steampunk, middle grade, uh, mm -hmm. space opera. What that's a, that's a more wide ranging and eclectic catalog that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of authors tend to kind of stick to a lane, mm -hmm. um, but you do it successfully in a bunch of, in a bunch of different areas. So what, um, how do you approach the differences in style between the genres? And like, mm. what, do you have one that's your favorite to work in? Or how do you go from like, I just finished a middle grade, now I'm switching to space opera. What do I do differently now? No, that's literally what just happened. I just, <laughs> I just turned in my, lap, my most recent middle grade. I just turned that in about a week and a half ago. And then in about a week and a half, I start uh, uh, working on the, uh, on the space opera. And, uh, and so basically, there's a, I try to give myself a two-week window between that, that switch. Um, and usually, I can get, uh, well, A, I'm catching up on the rest of my life. Because you know the last two weeks of me editing or, or working on a project, it's... <sighs> I, I look bad. I ain't gonna lie. I just look bad. Like everything goes to pot. You know, I'm not shaving. I'm barely showering. I'm just like all story all the time for about two weeks in a row. Uh, and my wife is just being very patient going, oh, yo, deadlines. And um, uh, but I, I try to give myself that two week window, one, to catch up on life. And then two, I, I try to squeeze in writing a, a short story. Because um, short stories are actually my first love. And, uh, and so I, I like to try and get those in, even if no one's asked me for a story, you know, it's like, well, let me just take a break and just play around in, in, in story for a while. Something to just give me that room and that space to just sort of switch gears. Um, and then, uh, and, so, and it just so happens this short story, A, someone had asked for, and B, it does tie in. It, it's actually letting me um, build out some of the world building for the, mm. for the uh, novel series. Wow. And so it's actually serving a real, uh, a, a, a double function there for me. Um, and it just gives my brain just time to, to, to reset and just sort of ease into, all right, we're transitioning to something different. Uh, so let, let's just do that. Um, and then it helps having a very patient agent who um, basically has to do quick educations on, oh, wait, we're switching markets again, huh? Okay, uh, all right, let's go. <laughs> uh, I didn't think about that from the agent's point of view. Oh, it's like, right. Because they can't oh, just, that, it's not just like you're churning out space opera over and over again, so they, can, oh, like, they know oh, who to talk to and who's going to buy this. And they're like, oh, so it's oh, middle grades. All right, the, detective. Okay, yeah, got it. There have been some late night come to Jesus conversations uh, that we've had to have. <laughs> so that's what I was going to ask. I'm sorry. Oh yeah. I, I was about to ask about your agent. I was like, how are they handling what you're doing, switching gears like that on a regular basis? Like, oof, like, oof. Uh, well, my agent's great. And, uh, and, and one of the things is before we even signed with each other, it was one of those, I'm a relational kind of person. So it's like, I need right. to know that I can get along with you and hang out with you. And frankly, gotcha. be able to text you randomly uh, in the middle of the night, because that's <laughs> just what I do. Right. Uh, I do that with my friends. And I'm just a agent, you were just coming on board as a friend. So uh, can you hang with that? And she was just like, you are never gonna be able to throw me. And I'm like, really? Because, you know, <laughs> two o'clock in the morning. Hey, you know what? Space dragons. How you like that? And I'm like, oh, okay. It's gonna be funny um, if it turns out all the uh, the variations and the, and the shifting of gears in your career is really just based on an ongoing effort to try to throw your agent <laughs> <laughs> so completely off. <laughs> well, well the, the the great thing was that like she had never sold a middle grade before, um, and I'm like, yeah, I have a middle grade detective novel. She's like, okay. Um, and then, uh, and actually, you know, peeling back the curtain a little bit, I mean, it, this, the, the, the usual suspect sold within like a couple of weeks. Oh. And she's just like, oh, wait a second. I think I love middle grade. Middle grade is <laughs> great. We can do this all day. And I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> so it's been, uh, it's been an education uh, and a roller coaster for both of us. So, I guess I, so. I, yeah, I never know what I'm going to do next. But I do know that my next three books are going to be a space opera. That, that, I have that far charted out. But oh. after that, who knows? <laughs> Well, okay, I do kind of know. I did text her the other day. It's like, hey, <laughs> how about a horror novel no one's asked me for? She's like, <laughs> for well, course. that's like you're just, you know, trying to fill out the uh, fill out the entire thing, like basically be able to say you've written something good in every genre. It looks in, like. in every genre. <laughs> every style, yeah. Um, well, that, uh, speaking of genre, um, one thing that you've, uh, you've talked about a lot before is Afrofuturism. 
as, mm -hmm. as a concept and, uh, and as a writing style and everything. It's been getting more attention in, in recent years, not because it is new, um, as, right. as people really need to understand, it's, it's not a new thing, but it has, there's been more spotlight on it in recent mm -hmm. years. Um, there's also been a little bit of debate to start this out about the, uh, the, the term Afrofuturism versus African futurism, as I know mm -hmm. uh, Nnedi Okorafor, for example, prefers to use that. Um, do you have a take on, on the, like, sort of the definition and the terminology of the genre to, uh, to begin with? Mm. Yeah, well, um, kind of. Um, and I think part of that is because, you know, the way I looked at it is, uh, so Afrofuturism is, is what Black writers and Black artists have done from the beginning. Uh, and, and so that's the way I've looked at it is, uh, it's a very, uh, you know, for me, it's always been African American centered. Um, and then, and then and which isn't to disparage anything else, any other work that, that's going on. I'm just like, no, this is the, the lens through which I'm doing my art. This is the lens through which, not just my art even, it's, it's been part of my social practice, uh, which is not another part of Afrofuturism. And so, uh, so that's, that's just the way I, I come at it. It's a, a way for me to, oh, well, actually, as far as the, the term goes, I look at it in, the, in terms of, so it's a way to critique the present that's rooted in the past, but looks to the future. Right. And, and that's what Afrofuturism is for me. And so, and that's definitely not a, a takeaway from African Futurism. I love African Futurism. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, I think Afrofuturism is basically uh, those of us in the diaspora reaching back to our African roots. So, right. and, and, and living life in light of our African roots. So I, I, I never want there to be the sort of us versus them sort of thing. It's no, we're all in right. this together, uh, d different aspects of the, of the same root work. So that's the way I come at it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's interesting because that's, uh, there is a difference in the, in the sort of approach there, but definitely you can see the commonality if you look at it through that lens. Um, You've also mentioned something I really found interesting about um, the, the fact that Afrofuturism extends beyond just writing, that, mm -hmm. that people think of it automatically in terms of like speculative fiction writing. Right. But um, for example, music, you, you've spoken before about how you can find Afrofuturist themes and styles and, and imagery and everything in music. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we'd like to hear a little about, little about that. Like where can people look for that sort of uh, Afrofuturist inspiration in music and oh. <laughs> how do you use it to pull in inspiration? That's interesting. Yourself? I literally just posted a, a, a Spotify Afrofuturism list uh, oh. uh, uh, oh. earlier this week uh, on, on Twitter. I see um, Allie taking notes. I want to, I we're going to go hunt that yeah. down. <laughs> <Yeah. Let's see. laughs> I need that list. <laughs> yes, and it was, uh, and, and so part of it, it was because uh, someone had asked me what was I listening to while uh, working on the Sorcerer's Project, mm -hmm. um, and I was like, well, it was a mix of uh, Africa uh, of uh, Afrofuturism and then some local hip hop artists, and so that's what my my playlist is. It's a, uh, it kind of takes you on a on a tour of uh, Afrofuturism. It starts with the work of uh, Sun Ra and, and the the mythology he mm -hmm. created uh, as as part of uh, his. Ooh, hugely productive out output right. um, and, and and so then it takes you to, through you know uh, there's some Herbie Hancock and some Parliament mm -hmm. Funkadelic there's mm -hmm. some uh, Jimi Hendrix thrown in there mm -hmm. um, as we, and then I take you through some uh, some hip-hops with some outcasts and some Misty Elliott uh, mm -hmm. so that that's thrown in there uh, so it's a uh, um, and in fact, what I'm listening to a lot now, some Flying Lotus and some uh, Kamasi Washington. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so love Kamasi. Right there. Oh, right? Okay. Right? <laughs> wait, wait, have, wait, have you heard Thundercat? I have. I, I think I threw him one Thundercat track, but I'm, I want to go back and I want to do more. Oh, and, yeah. and actually, so now that you mentioned that, that's been a great bridge for me because I, I still work with middle school students. Right. And, uh, and so we've, uh, and so I was in charge of, of detention. Uh, for a while, but then uh, the school was like, "Yeah, whatever you're doing in, in there, we can't call it detention because it's <laughs> it's not anything that uh, you know." Cause I'm like, detention. It's not a pun well because when I started, detention was like me staring at them, there's them staring at me, staring at me, and we just have to be quiet for 45 minutes. I'm like, this is doing none of us any, any good. good, right? So then I changed it into, "All right, so while we're here together." Uh, you are free. I, I I tell you what, you got sent here for a reason. Why don't you create a story of why you got sent here? I don't care if it's the truth. I just want to see a, a great story. And while you're doing that, we're going. I'm going to expose you to different music. And so nice. we start off with uh, a lot of uh, uh, Miles Davis, and and then, and then I bounce back between Miles Davis and Kamasi Washington. And so to see these middle schoolers start to really vibe with, oh wait, wait, what kind of music is this again? I'm like, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> 
Right. Well, and you're involved with a, a local group, right? With a hip hop group or a hip hop collective? Um, uh, yes and no. So okay. I, I'm uh, the local group I'm, I'm, I work with is uh, called the Kepra Institute. And it's a, a grassroots organization. Um, that's, the, the focus is, is ultimately training up youth leaders, but we mm -hmm. end up, we, the way we train them up is to uh, uh, use entrepreneurial experience to, uh, to, to as, as our classrooms, basically. So we'll, we will start small businesses and it's like, all right, now you all are in charge of this business. Now let, let's do it, let's uh, make it work. Um, and, so, uh, and, and so there's parts of it that's involved in food justice, some of it inv involved in uh, environmental justice. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, incubator hubs that, that have recently started up. And then one of the uh, areas has been uh, what we call Cafe Creative, which is uh, one of the areas I'm, I'm attached to, where we've been networking local artists and uh, of all stripes just to say, hey, you know what, we don't have enough uh, uh, venue spaces that we control. So what if we had a, a venue space that we could control um, so artists uh, uh, can come in, uh, we would provide the equipment for you free. That way there's no obstacles for you to, to, to do your craft. Um, and so we, we create that hub. And then because of this sort of work, I've been, um, <laughs> this is, so this is where I get involved with all these hip hop artists. Cause then, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I refer right. to myself as like the old man in the club. Uh, Cause it's <laughs> like, dude, I just turned 50 and I'm hanging out with all these young dudes and I'm just like, oh, and it just, <laughs> Uh, and so they are re-educating me on music, for example, because I could quit listening to hip hop and like, oh, the 90s. Right. Right. <laughs> and so apparently a lot has happened in hip hop since which, uh, they, they want to uh, educate me on. So well, I think uh, the 90s were only like 10 years ago, right? That's, I believe you are yeah. absolutely correct. Yeah. It was only I'm, about 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sticking with it, guys. Sorry. Right. <laughs> That's fine. I'm 100% with you on that. I got, oh, man. Just even now, like I'm, I'm teaching kids that literally, like they, the '90s to them is like what the '60s seemed like to us when we right, were their age. Right. Like this, this time that was forever ago, and all these crazy things happened. And they talk about the '90s, like because I teach high schoolers, uh, mm -hmm. I teach literature to 11th graders, and yeah, they talk about the '90s like that, like it was just this this time where things were crazy. I'm like, I, was, I mean, yeah, kind of, but <laughs> right, right. I, I lived through that. It was it was, it was okay. I, I was I was okay. I mean, I was born in '83. I'm just like I. I lived through the nineties. I got I got prints and I got some things. I, I got some great things from the nineties. Right. The nineties weren't too bad. They weren't yeah. too bad. Yeah, they weren't they weren't that bad. I was kind of a fan actually. Yeah. I think I think we all are kind of fans of the nineties. I mean right. it's it really kind of we saw things that that the kind of sixties produced for us through children. <laughs> you know what I mean? Through ideologies. Right. They shot us to the moon and we got to do things and say things. That at one point we really couldn't say and do and yeah it was it was an amazing time yeah. but anyway <laughs> <laughs> it's a progression right. well so so along with that project in the community you are really involved in just indianapolis in general right you you do a lot of things for your community there can you maybe tell us about your community and, and why you love yeah. it the way you do um you know that's a good question so the uh, so uh, you know I, I get asked about some of the themes of my short stories, for example, and uh, and one of the major themes I've realized as part of my in my short stories is this whole idea of identity, and uh, and so Indianapolis for me is just another way of exploring my identity. Um, I have a lot of family here, I have a lot of roots here, and uh, and and, in, and so. That, that forms a, a big part of, of who I am, but but not just that. As I explore more and more of Indiana, I mean, it's like it's, uh, of Indianapolis in particular. I mean, it's like it's like a, any other part of our culture. It's like there are a whole lot of stories that we were never told. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole lot of history we never knew. And uh, just to, for example, you know, just the fact that uh, Indiana Avenue, you know, that was like uh, that in Harlem was like the mecca of black culture for a mm -hmm. long time. And I'm like, the Indiana Avenue that's just five minutes away from me, that Indiana Avenue, was the mecca of black culture for a long time. Oh, all right. Uh, you know, so it's, so as I, I just keep peeling it back and, and like, what, what else don't I know? Um, and then, and what else, uh, and when, what does that mean for me as a person? What does it mean for, for our culture? Uh, you know, how do I explore all these sort of ideas? And so um, in my, in, so my novel, Pit My Airship, uh, 
becomes a, a thorough exploration of uh, of local Indiana, peeling back that life, you know, both uh, examining the whole nature of the steampunk genre, but also, you know, what was turn of the century uh, Indianapolis like? And, and what does that, 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 that period, how does that, how has that impacted uh, black life, black community, that where, where black people find ourselves in, in the city? Because there are reasons why we are where we are. Uh, and so let me let me peel back some of those reasons. What you what do you mean in the 1920s? One in three people in Indiana were members of the Klan proudly. One wow. in three. Yikes. It's like, mm. oh, so that's going to have some political ramifications. <laughs> 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 and, and so, uh, but but this is all history that we don't know that we haven't been taught. And so you know, I, I get to explore that. And, and I guess part of it, I guess it boils down to wherever I am. It's about being rooted, and I'm rooted here in Indianapolis. And if I'm going to be rooted here in any sort of authentic way, I want to explore that history and know as much about it as possible. Hey, Jesse, we lost you. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, sorry, but that threw me for a second there. Um, <laughs> steampunk, you don't normally associate, like when, when a lot of people think steampunk, they don't think black or Afro Afrofuturism or that right. sort of thing. And I love the fact that you're taking and putting a completely different lens on this, because let's be honest, that it would have been multicultural. It would have right. been, mm -hmm. and a lot of innovations, frankly, come from the black community. So I, I love that you're taking that and, and turning that light on it. Yeah, well, um, I mean, because the, the Pitt Airship, the novel, uh, you know, I, I wrote that literally 10 years after Pitt My Airship, the short story. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and and at the time, you're right. I mean, one of the things I looked at with, with steampunk was, it was like, this genre seems to have just systematically erased Black people. Right? Yes. Uh, like, uh, and, and there seems to be a, 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 a sort of you know, let's look at the good old days, you know, sort, sort of uh, right. uh, aspect to uh, uh, steampunk. And I'm just like, ooh, mm -hmm. there's a, yeah, let's, let's dig into uh, some, some of the, what, what makes it the, the good old days uh, type thing. Right. Yeah. right. And so, right. Uh, because, uh, but then as it turns out, that's been, it's been great for me to do because I'm just like, steampunk is, uh, it gives me all of the language I need to deconstruct all of my favorite themes. So sure. it's like, it's all right there, you right. know. Uh, waiting for me to, to to tackle. So that's one of the reasons why I've loved it so much. Yeah, well, I really about, love it. Oh, go right. ahead. Oh, no, I, I, what, we, what you were saying about thinking about steampunk and about it glossing over, like when I think about steampunk, I do think about black things. I do think about black people. I think about George Washington Carver. I think about mm -hmm. black inventors. Mm -hmm. um, I think about those things and, and to even not, to even gloss over that mm -hmm. is, it, it boggles my mind. Because I mean, like, think about think about like a mad scientist, George Washington Carver. Think about what would happen if he decided to be a mad scientist. You know? Oh, oh, oh! I did, and that's why. So, <laughs> has a, has three of my favorite characters I've ever written. Um, Sleepy, who's a, a, an open mic poet. Um, One hundred and twenty degrees of knowledge, Allah, who is a, <laughs> a, a professional social provocateur. Uh, and uh, Deaconess Blues, who is my mad scientist character. And I, I you know, when, when this book opens up, she's just been kicked out of Oxford because shenanigans. I and, love it. <laughs> <laughs> shenanigans. Right. So uh, it, it, it really does. It's, it's, it's such a great playing field and, and there's so much out there. Um, and then, and, and actually my, uh, my, my novella Buffalo Soldier is actually in that same universe for that same reason. Mm -hmm. uh, Buffalo Soldier actually takes place 10 years before Pin My Airship. Okay. Uh, wow. But it gave, it gave me an excuse to examine a whole other aspect of, uh, of steampunk, which is the, the effects of colonialism or the lack or, or, or the non effects of colonialism in this case, which was what if Jamaica had, uh, was never colonized? Mm. And what if Jamaica was allowed to control all of its resources? Um, and then what if Jamaica be could become a, uh, became its own superpower in the West? Um, okay. Full disclosure, my mother's from Jamaica, so <laughs> well, there, there is that. Um, you, you've already said that you explore your roots, so it makes I sense. I explore my roots. <laughs> uh, and so giving her this alternate history of Jamaica, uh, even though she doesn't actually read any of my work, but she loves to hear me talk about it. So yeah. I get to, uh, she gets to hear me talk about, oh no, this one time when Jamaica was a world superpower, she, you know, 
Yeah, she's right there with it. Love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I can't tell yet, Jesse, if you're back with us. No, you are not. <laughs> okay. No worries. No worries. Um, These things will happen. If they're they happen, absolutely they do. Happen. And I can just keep talking. Shenanigans. But. Yeah, it's shenanigans. <laughs> um, so, so let's, uh, let's see where else we were going to go with this. This is really fun when Jesse falls off and the rest of us are like, Hey buddy, you Let were this, in charge. Where are you going? <laughs> I, I, I do have a, I do have a question for you. Sure. So, I mean, given, given the, the process that you take to write, um, what have you found to be most difficult when developing characters who are black and intellectual? Mm. Well, <laughs> so it's actually, it's more of a humbling process. Right. Uh, because it's just like, because a lot of it, like even, like with the space opera and all the mythology that I'm, I'm developing for the space opera, mm -hmm. um, it's one of those, I want to, I handle it with care and, and with humility, because it's like, I want to do right by these characters. Right, right. And, and, and so I just feel the certain weight of responsibility uh, whenever I'm creating these characters, um, where it's like, hey, I don't want to depend on tropes. I'm, I'm trying to carve new ground. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to create new stories for us. Um, how haven't we been seen, uh, for example, right. in, in pop culture or in literature? Uh, you know, so I'm trying to carve out all these new elements uh, while I'm at it. So probably the hardest part for me is uh, honestly dreaming big enough. Right. And uh, and so I, like uh, for the the space opera alone, I think I this has probably been the most world building I've done on a project. Yeah, ever. I would say ever, because uh, I probably spent a year and a half just thinking through possibilities mm. and, and dreaming of what could be uh, before I put a pen to paper. And, uh, and and like I said, even now, even because I'm I've, I'm already finished draft number two, mm. but I'm about ready to sit down and, and go, all right, so now here comes draft number three. Now that I have all the ideas in place. I'm about to do draft number three. But before I do draft number three, I'm going to write this short story to build out some more elements of the world. Right. Uh, so that once those are firmly in my head, I can now take those into draft number three, too, because, you know, I've between drafts two and three, I've had a chance to dream some more. Right. Uh, and I want to include some of this in there in there, too. Uh, and so. Uh, so, yeah, so it's the whole it's the whole idea of dreaming big enough. Uh, it's probably my biggest challenge. Maurice, if you were going to build a reading list of uh, here is an Afrofuturist starter kit mm. for people Ooh. who have not read after futurist novels yet mm -hmm. can you give me a few of those uh let's see yes <laughs> so let me oh, oh wait. well so we have to chart we have we would have to start with recent new york times best-selling author octavia butler yes yes i was so excited to see it yes. 50 right. years in the making <laughs> yes. right right um so we we all come back to uh uh to parable of the sower Yep. Um, and it's interesting how that how that book has just impacted us on so many different levels. Uh, so even the, the work uh, I do with the Kepper Institute, uh, uh, reading is such an important part of our work. And uh, how many times uh, the parable of the sower has been read. Uh, and, and we've had like at least four book studies to date just doing parable of the sower. Yep. Um, because we just learn so much in terms of uh, in, in and have so many applications for it, just even us doing the work that we do in community. Um, so that that probably tops the list. Uh, a personal favorite of mine would be Futureland by uh, Walter Mosley. Yes. Um, he's not normally known as a, a sci-fi writer, um, but his collection, uh, Futureland, um, and it's nine interconnected short stories. Um, well, when I first encountered Futureland, that was transformative for me because uh, at the time I was a, a, I was a, a horror writer. Okay. Um, but then I, I read that book and I'm just like, man, there are so many things uh, I hadn't even thought to do with, with writing that uh, Futureland just sort of opened up for me. Uh, and so uh, Futureland is, uh, would, would be uh, definitely uh, one of my required readings. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, I can't sit around and do this long explanation for each of the books. <laughs> um, all right, so other books that would be on here. Um, uh, oh shoot! What was that? Uh, St Stephen Barnes, uh, Lions. Oh, ah, I forget. But it was his uh, his alternate history. Um, hang on, it, it loses me right now. Um, but Stephen Barnes' uh, work would be on there. Um, uh, Nettie's uh, Binti. Yes. Uh, uh, Nettie Corfor's Binti. Um, how, how long to a Black Futures Month? Uh, 
Lion's Blood, thank you very much. Lion's Blood, um, <laughs> Lion's Blood thank you. Um, uh, How Long Till Black Futures Month, uh, N.K. Jemison. Oh, and, uh, and, and we cannot forget uh, Dark Matter, uh, the anthology yes. by uh, uh, Sheree Renee Sheree. Thomas. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and she is uh, a, a, a treasure to the genre that yes. I, I think she's just now beginning to get a taste of, of, of the appreciation that she deserves right. uh, for, for the, the work that she's done in the, in the genre and community. Um, let's see. I could do this all day. I mean, don't go. <laughs> yeah, we, we love Cherie here. She actually was at Multiverse our first year. She agreed oh, to come and, and okay. be at the, uh, yeah. So she is fantastic. Yeah, she was our first uh, uh, multi, uh, she was our first guest at uh, Glitchy Pancakes as well for our first podcast, yes. which was, okay. was fantastic. It, uh, we loved her to have her on and yeah, she's amazing. Oh, and then uh, a Mothership. It's a, an anthology from Rosarian Publishing um, that, uh, that, that should give you a nice uh, overview of, uh, of Afrofuturism also. Excellent. Right, right. I haven't nice. actually read that one. So that is, okay. everything else I at least was familiar with if I haven't actually read it. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, Cherie's Nine Bar Blues just came out yeah. and I have not read it. I own it, but it's sitting on my yeah. shelf waiting for me. And it also has a fantastic cover. So. <laughs> right, I, I just got it myself. So. Yes, <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Um, well, I am can. guessing, Jesse, you are still not here with us. No, he is not. That's all right. We will just keep moving along. Listen, Jesse so, lost audio and I lost the light. So oh. it got darker here. We're good. <laughs> no, we're, but we're good. We're, we're, we we'll just good. keep going. We'll keep we going. see Jesse yeah, smiling you know. faces, and and I got a little, I got a little Batman on me, a little darker. <laughs> That's fine. It's the all good spot. stuff. Yes. So in your free time, which uh, clearly is absolutely copious um, yes. amounts of free time that you yes. have, <laughs> tell us what else you're involved in. I you teach. What do you teach? So I work uh, in what's called the resource room uh, okay. at, at the school, and so. Um, <laughs> so I have no teaching license. Let me start okay. there. Sure. Um, but uh, I had sent my, my, my both my children to this middle school, and uh, and I love my children. I love my ch children. Uh, my youngest, however, will put you through your paces, and uh, <laughs> and he put this school through their paces, and, uh, and and there was a series of escalating incidents um that eventuated in we'll just say a minor police investigation type situation <laughs> you know as, as one does right um and so uh and so i walked him through the situation i walked uh the actual people who committed the offense uh i, I walked them through the situation all the affected parties the school my family you know i walked mm -hmm. them all through the situation and at the time i was just a, i was a sub at the school because uh, i had made a point of trying to sub at whatever school my sons were at just so i could be support for them mm -hmm. or for the teachers, you know. <laughs> Either way, sure. Right. Um, and so then I get called into the principal's office and I know full, full well, you know, I'm about to be fired because of uh, <laughs> all, all, everything that's gone on. Um, and, and she goes, the, the way you walk everyone through the situation, uh, you know, we can't teach that. Mm -hmm. and, and the way you work with students, we can't teach that. And so would you be interested in working here full time? And so I was like, yes. <laughs> um, and so I, I work one-on-one -on -one with students or in small group supporting students who, you know, are struggling in, in, in whatever way they're struggling. Sure. Um, they, they, they have to, they go down to, you know, Mr. Broadus's office and, uh, you know, they'll either reset down there or we'll talk through whatever they're going through. Or sometimes it's just or academically, I'll just work through them in a one-on-one -on -one situation. So it's good for them. It's good for the teachers. Um, it, it's, it's been, it's been great. Uh, uh, and, uh, and although I am to all the time make sure I point out that when I wrote The Usual Suspects, it in no way was it involved the current school that I'm working in. <laughs> let, me, let me go ahead and throw that caveat out there too. Disclaimer. Um, absolutely, yes. absolutely. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I, I say I have three full-time jobs. I'm a writer, I do uh, community work with the Kepper Institute and I, and I work at the school full-time. Um, in my spare time, such as it is, uh, I'm uh, now the editor over at Apex Magazine, uh, so I, I'm doing that too. Uh, uh, let's see, and I mostly have, the bulk of my free time is literally just revolves around friends and family. Uh, you know, how much of that can I can I get done uh, uh, in terms of you know trying to you know re or, or having that priority of my life is like you know what when all said and done you know I, I am about my family I'm about my friends and then everything else sort of fits in around that and I have to remind myself of that to make sure that that stays the priority right. uh, that I that I actually live out. Yep. Uh, so. Um, and then after that, yeah, I'm uh, in this room 
this is my uh, my office, and I'm surrounded by twenty thousand comic books. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, my so hands started ringing. <laughs> right. So this one there is that. <laughs> So, 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 of your twenty thousand comic books, let's let's pick five that you love the best. Oh my goodness! Oh <laughs> my goodness! That's ridiculous. <laughs> that is ridiculous. That is so ridiculous. I would never right. ask that of anyone. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> stung. Shall oh. I withdraw? <laughs> no, no, I'm, not, I'm gonna see if I can do this. I'm gonna see if I can do this. This is uh, a challenge. I, all right, so obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but Black Panther, I'm going to keep all my Black Panthers. In fact, that's okay. what I'll do. It's like, if I had to get rid of my comic books, what would there I do? There you go. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, would keep, go. I would keep my, my Black Panther run. But my Black Panther, my Black Panther run begins with his very first appearance in Fantastic Four. Right. So I have a complete Black Panther run. Wow. Yes. Oh. So that's like right. the 1966. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay. So I go, I go back. Nice. Uh, let's see. I would keep my collection of Sandman. I have a okay. complete run of uh, Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Yeah, Neil Gaiman. Um, and, and and Neil Gaiman was real informative to uh, me coming up as a as a fantasy author. And uh, in fact, for a long time there, I, I would make it a ritual to just reread Sandman like every couple mm -hmm. of years. Um, anytime I felt a loss of the love of story, uh, Sandman had a way of just rekindling that love of story in me. Um, let's see, who would I go after that? What? <laughs> uh, I I, something by Alan Moore. Okay. Uh, I would be torn. Uh, so we'll just say Alan Moore, <laughs> and so I'm going to cheat here. I'm going to say my Alan Moore Watchmen Swamp Thing V for Vendetta collection. Fair Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. I, I'm with it. Uh, let's see. Man, this is tough. <laughs> this is for us. Hmm. That's three. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there. This, <laughs> okay. is, this, is, right. this is hurting too much. I have stressed Maurice out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You didn't even pose a question to me. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. You're good, yeah. Jesse. I'm yeah, clear. You're good, Jesse. Oh, you are. You sorry about that. Sorry a, for the hiccup. Appreciate it. You, but. You, you didn't even pose a question to me and I'm hurting. Like, right. really bad. Like, I'm thinking about the comics that I have. I'm just, by the way, if you haven't heard, Comixology is now giving yes. away all of the Black Panther. I, I, I did hear that. It, it was, so, <laughs> I, love, I love my friends. So, uh, literally 10 minutes after the news of, of Chadwick's passing happened, mm -hmm. A dozen people, including my agent, texted me to check in on me to make sure I was okay. Right. right. Um, and then uh, when the news about Comicsology broke, yep, I had about a half dozen people going, "Hey, hey, all the books are, are out there now." And I'm like, "I'm on it. I'm on it." <laughs> yeah, yeah I, was, I, was I hope they keep doing that for a long time too. Like, I hope that by the time they, uh, mm -hmm. by the time we run this panel, I hope that's still going on. So. Yep look and check and see yeah. as that was a tough choice ali that, that was uh <laughs> isn't her asking the hard questions man right. oh, man you <laughs> shouldn't leave me in charge everyone knows this this is a bad was, idea you know, the hard questions are the good questions you know <laughs> it's, it's making you think it's, you gotta pick your pick your top five comics out of what is right. 20 thousand 20 thousand 20 thousand yeah <laughs> but you know I'll, giving you some leeway to go with series if you have to because right. you, know, you have to have some room yeah and you yeah. can't forget swamp thing at any point, at any point in that conversation, right? Ever, like <laughs> ever. But oh man, oh, yeah, we're gonna have to talk after this. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> we're gonna gotcha. have to talk after this. See <laughs> Rob's uh, stacks of comics at the moment. <laughs> oh, those right. people do exist. <laughs> my, my pride is my del my Daredevil run. That's my pride. It's, it's and see, I was thinking about I was thinking about what Frank Miller thing to do, and yeah. I, I, did, I was like, ooh, the Daredevil, <laughs> yeah. uh, Dark Knight Returns. <laughs> uh, yes. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, much, you have done some writing for uh, for comic stuff before, like what. Uh, I've always been curious how that's different, like as far as your process and what you have to deal with, how that's different from writing on your own, like you're writing sort of with someone else's property and also there's such a heavy incorporation of visual style. Um, mm -hmm. Like, do you, it is another, just another type of genre where you have to switch your mindset and say, okay, I'm doing this now. Yeah. Well, I haven't written formally for comics. I've written for comic book properties though. Um, and so, uh, in fact, I just turned in one that I don't think I'm allowed to talk about yet which you'll be hearing about not too long after this airs, I believe. Okay. Yes, that's my gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> um, we'll talk about it off mic if you can. Right, right. <laughs> um, uh, but, but I haven't written for them and for, but like that, do, so doing that work and writing for role-playing games too, um, having written for uh, both Marvel superheroes and for Firefly, um, 
it's it's been great. Well, and then and then realizes that whatever I do in those in those universe, in those properties does become canon. Yeah. Which when they told me that about Firefly, I was just like, oh, 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 hang on. <laughs> that's what you. that's the I coolest part of it. Like that that's what always seems the most exciting is that you're creating canon. Like we had um, right. recently on Glitchy Pancakes, we had uh, LL McKinney. Mm -hmm. uh, on as a guest and she has uh, an upcoming uh, she's writing nubia for dc right um which is super exciting and that and, and she seemed like she was just thrilled because that's like it's a story she's wanted to see it's a story she's wanted to tell i just mm -hmm. can't imagine what it's like to be in a position where like i get to write like this becomes part of the universe for this right. kid of my right. fandom it becomes part of, of my fandom, fandom. Right. oh no and believe me i've been uh, uh with, with, uh, with uh with the recent success i've i've have had that talk with my agent of how can i use my powers for evil right now <laughs> and uh and so it's like so now i'm like what what are the areas of fandom i would really love to write in so i'm just out now sending out queries and i'm like look here i'm here to write for you just so right. you know it's like uh, i've done it before and here's who i would love to write for well, so, do you want you want to put some of those out there right now because people are going to watch this, and the more you know, blast it out there. Is that's there any, right. Any properties yep. you would just love to write for? Oh, so what I'd love to write. So I'd love to write a Lando novel. Mm. Uh, this is yes. not a secret. I would love to write a Lando novel. Um, uh, in Star Trek, man. If look here, Deep Space Nine is my fr oh. <laughs> and, and, I, and I've watched every iteration of Star Trek, but Deep yeah. Space Nine does it for me. So if I could have, uh, uh, let, let me have a chance to write a Cisco novel. I oh, will write, yes. oh man, I, in fact, I'm, I'm tempted to, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that the spirit of Cisco is just above me, we'll say. Okay. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nice. Um, who else? I mean, those would be, be my top ones. Although I do have a love of, of Cyborg and Mr. Terrific, actually. Oh, over, oh boy. Uh, so, uh, man, oh. I would just. All right. So, yeah, there we go. All so right. I'll, I'll stop there. There's, all right. That's putting, putting some stuff out in, there in the universe. Put it out to the with. universe? Yeah. I'm, I'm shocked you didn't say Swamp Thing. I'm shocked you didn't say so. I'm shocked <laughs> you didn't say Swamp Thing. I could, I could see you writing the bayou and just uh man. sorry now you done said no 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 we're not, we're not doing this we're not doing this we're not doing this putting <laughs> ideas in his head Rob the man's sure busy did. enough because I, I wanted because like, like one of my favorite horror movies of all time was Eve's Bayou Ooh. and I was just like oh, oh man oh, Eve's the, Bayou tied this the, oh my oh the right you heard right? it here first. You heard it here first. <laughs> oh, I would do some things. Wow, some that would be amazing. That would be amazing. Ooh. Mm. You know, you were talking about uh, wanting to go and like use your powers for evil and get out there and do some stuff in different fandoms. You said uh, at one point, that, I, I don't remember where you said it, but um, but that lives should be lived missionally. Mm. Um, that's something that really struck me is that because that's, I don't think everyone necessarily um thinks about that like consciously enough and um like what what does that mean to you and like in in the world of science fiction and fantasy like in the world of fandom why do you consider living missionally to be important and what do you think of as as like your mission as you see it yeah so uh, so that idea came from uh, me growing up in the church and, and having a faith is a, a big part of my life so faith uh, makes up a huge part of who i am as a person um, and I think at the b bottom line of, uh, you know, if we, you, you, you pull back my faith, my faith is all about uh, an intentionality of how I move through this world. Okay. Um, and, and uh, you know, so if I look at it as sort of a, like joining in God's redemptive mission, you know, as a sort of a big picture thing, or, or even breaking it down as I just want to leave the world a better place for me having been here, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so how, how can I move with that sort of intentionality? Uh, and uh, and I've thought about that a lot lately, especially as I've switched, you know, writing for, in different areas. And so, um, and where it has struck most home with me is, has been with my Afrofuturist work. Because um, I realized that both my, uh, my Afrofuturism leanings and my faith sort of spring from the same place, which is this idea of a future hope and, and making the world a better place. And so, um, because I, I have that in, in terms of my intentionality, it impacts not just my writing, but it, it impacts uh, the work that I do in the community. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the Kepler Institute uh, has me as their resident Afrofuturist, uh, <laughs> for example. And so, and what that looks like is, so my Afrofuturism work and the work of Afrofuturism impacts the work in the space, but the work in the space impacts what I'm writing. 
and so and so it creates a cycle of us you know having this mindset of no we the reason why we're doing the things we want to do, that we're doing is because we are working to create the world we want to see uh, and, yeah. and, 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 that, and that's our, our mission as a community organization. That's my mission as a, as a writer. Um, that's my intentionality in, in my faith. It, you know, it's, it just, uh, it, all, it all springs from that, that same place. Yeah, and I, I can see that's, that's an interesting way to look at it where you have like, there, there's no, it's a sort of a continuum like mm-hmm. you were describing of, of mm-hmm. like your, your life, your beliefs, your work are all just kind of, you know, feeding off of each other. Right. Going in, and, and you can see some of that like in the, in the Knights of Breton Court um, like that's um if you could tell us a, just a little bit about that you could probably explain it better than i can but it's a you know it's sort of an arthurian legend but in a much more interesting urban fantasy setting right. so yeah uh, and so uh, so yeah so i was retelling the legend of king arthur except i was telling it through the eyes of uh, homeless teenagers and gang members in indianapolis, um, in indianapolis right in indianapolis right um but that's because at the time i was doing a lot of work with a, a group called outreach and Cor- uh, outreach inc um and it's a, a homeless teen ministry here in town uh and uh, and so the, the whole book series actually sprang as a writing exercise I was doing with the kids at the time. Uh, we were just try, uh, doing like just uh, writing exercises. You know, I was trying to get them to just uh, reimagine their lives in, 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 in a whole bunch of different ways. And, and, and I was just like, <laughs> and so I, uh, they were like, well, what do you mean? And so then I was like, well, how about if I imagine you as prince and princesses of the streets? And then uh, and, and that line just really stuck with me. Um, and I started write, writing out what that could look like. And then next thing I know, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm writing Kingmaker uh, accidentally, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and taking and, and taking that to sort of a literal place and saying, okay, right, princes, exactly. princes and princesses mm-hmm. of the streets, like, okay, why can't that be? Like, why can't I write about that being a real thing? Right. But right. if it actually right. was, um, what about? I know there, there's uh, definitely from what you've been able to say about it so far, some Afrofuturist threads, strongly speaking, in uh, in the upcoming Space Opera trilogy. Mm-hmm. What what are you comfortable telling us about that trilogy so far? Like, what should we be expecting? Well, so the term Afrofuturism was new to me. So I had a short story collection came out in like 2016. So I had Buffalo Soldier and the short story collection, The Voices of Martyrs, come out uh, both in 2016. And uh, and, uh, and 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 Voices of Martyr, uh, you know, had, had lots of rave reviews for, for Voices of Martyrs. Um, but I noticed that there were several reviews who were like, oh man, we, we love these stories, you know, because it's broken up into past, present, and future. Um, and a lot of the stories in the past and the present, you know, you know, definitely show my horror leanings and my, my horror roots, we'll, we'll say. Um, and they're like, oh no, we, we, we love these stories. But when Maurice starts doing his Afrofuturist work, you know, that's where he really starts to shine. And I'm just like an Afro what now? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so then I started investigating Afro, that's, that was when I began my journey with Afrofuturism. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and so as I've done some, uh, you know, you know, I've, I've written some more, uh, I, I, I put out some more short stories, and then, um, and then I realized there's a, a theme to a lot of my short stories, uh, all, all the ones that take place in the future. And I was just like, you know, probably 95% of these probably are in the same universe. What, oh. what could that look like? And so I, I started to pull together all the various threads of all of my stories that take place in the future. Um, and then I started that year and a half, like I said, of world building of what would it look like to have this essentially a, a black space kingdom? Um, or, or as I talk about in, in my community work, you know, what is it we're working towards? What, what does that look like? You know, so what does it look like if say we win, quote unquote, what, 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 what sort of new society could we, what sort of society could we create? What, what would that look like? Um, so it gave us a, a chance to just dream together as a group. You know, what, how, if, if it was left up to us, what would education look like? What would our economic system look like? Right. You know, uh, so we, we had, start having all these really big picture conversations and, uh, and, and this all sets the backdrop for uh, the trilogy. The trilogy is called All the Stars. Um, and then the, and book one is called Sweep of Stars. And actually each of the books, uh, book titles is, is taken from a Langston Hughes poem called Stars. Oh, okay. So. Nice, um, I love that tie-in. So thank you. There, so there's a, uh, so basically look for, uh, so basically black people have taken over the moon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. And, and formed a whole society up there. Um, and, it, but the, so the, but the actual, the, the kingdom such as, well, I'm, kingdom is not the right word, but the, 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 it extends from the moon to, uh, Titan, 
and a, a, mining, a mining colony further out in space. Um, all of which has pretty significant roots, uh, mostly with Titan. Uh, that's a direct tie into Sun Ra and his mythology. I, I, that's <laughs> pretty much that's what that's, what that's about. <laughs> nice. um, and so, uh, so we have have them. We have uh, Mars. We have, have Earth. And uh, and right now, you should be feeling a bit of an expanse feel to it. But then I go in a totally, totally different direction. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> sure, like, it does. Go. Right. So, uh, they, so it was pitched as Black Panther meets the Expanse. So, that's what I was gonna mention. Yeah, I was like, I was like, if he doesn't say it, I'm gonna say yeah. it because although like th those pitch things are, it's always gonna necessarily be reductive, right? Like mm -hmm. it does, it's not gonna tell your whole story. We know you're gonna take it in different directions than either one of those stories right. and go a lot, go your own place with it. But yeah. at the same time, there's a reason that people take comparable works and say such and such meets such and such as mm -hmm. a pitch, mm -hmm. because I mean that worked for me when I heard when I first heard about the, your your deal with Tor and they said the Expanse meets Black Panther. I was like, okay, you got me. I mean that's right. I buy it. This like there's, there's no way I'm not. I don't. Hey, that works for me. As soon as that pitch, and that's one of those things that like one of those things that accidentally flies out your mouth. Uh -huh. But then when it does, you're like, shoot, I want to buy that book. All right. yeah. <laughs> Wish it was already done. It's like, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> Could somebody else go ahead and write that so I can just read it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you mentioned that doing a lot of uh, doing a lot of world building on this, which sounds necessary because with this, you're, you're dealing with a really kind of you know far flung, a, a whole lot. There's a lot of science behind that too. So like there's a, and you have you have a background in the sciences as well. Um, so that's is that something you typically like to do? Is spend spend a lot of time on the world building, or do you like to just dig yeah. in and start writing the plans? So that was that actually is what actually bites me in the butt fairly often. And so when, uh, and so we'll, let's go back that 10 years to when I first wrote Pit My Airship. Um, uh, there was a positive reaction to Pit My Airship, but then there was this creeping criticism of, you know, you have a very densely built world and we can tell there's a whole world here that you don't really explore. And we want to see more of that world. And I'm just like, like well, that's great, but I was only paid for 6,000 words. So I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but then, uh, but so then I, it's been a, like a thought experiment of mine where I would take like, I'd go, I'd keep going back to pit my airship. And I was like, well, I had this throwaway line about something about Jamaica in there. So I was like, well, let me, let me, uh, let me, let me write about, uh, build, flesh that out a little bit. And, uh, and then that led to a, a novelette called Step and Razor. And I was like, oh, I guess there was a bit here in this world. Well, let me take another <laughs> line. Um, and then that led to Buffalo Soldier. And I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> I wonder if I can keep keep this up. So there's uh, so there's like a dozen short stories and novellas and novelettes that's in the world before I even got around to writing Pimp My Airship, mm -hmm. the novel. Um, and I'm and, and all that sprang because I, I do as much world building for a short story as I do for a novel. It's and, a, that and, sort of thing comes through, too. And, and it comes through. Right. And so when I was starting to write, because uh, 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 with, with when I when I was selling the the the, the um, all the stars to tour, um, you know I had to come up with the, the you know the here, here's the outline, you know that sort of thing. And as, as I was coming up with the outline, because what I pitched originally uh, turns out to be just one storyline of the of the of the book. Uh, but when I, because I have these uh, female soldiers that are out exploring the space, and that's actually what the book was supposed to be about. And then I started doing the world building of, well, here's the world that they, that, that they would come from. And then when I was done doing that world building, I was just like, if I write this book, this storyline, with this world, and basically they people only see this world for one chapter, and then the ladies are off into space. I'm going to be pilloried. So why don't I, why don't I just now, as I already hear the criticism, I'll go ahead and create other storylines so that we can further explore this world. And so, uh, and so that's, that's what I ended up doing. So there's actually there's three storylines of, of book one um, that, that flip back and forth, one on a generational starship, one on uh, following the, these soldiers into space, and one that's just about the about the kingdom itself as, as it wrestles with the idea of what does succession look like. Um, so we have all these, these, these three storylines that sort of interplay with each other. That's, that's sort of depth, like the, showing it from, you know, past, present and future that, uh, <clears throat> that to me is what creates a universe that feels lived in mm -hmm. and that feels believable because I mean, when we're, I think everybody that reads speculative fiction, we want to suspend our disbelief and think that whatever world we're in is possible. And that kind of detail makes it feel like it, it makes it feel so much more fleshed out 
to where, I mean, yeah, you do want to know the different threads and where did this go and what's the history of this. Mm -hmm. But even yeah. without that, it just gives it that, that feeling of like, there's a legacy here that existed before I got here and it's going to continue right. after I, after I leave. Um, and speaking on that yeah. to, uh, I guess right. to kind of wrap things up here, that's you're, you as prolific as you're being and everything that you have coming out, um, that, that, <sighs> The, the kind of legacy that you're putting out there as far as your uh, your contributions that's something that I think we all really appreciate like what you do setting an example for the speculative fiction community because you do make community involvement and mission oriented living a part of what you do and you let that be part of a continuum that involves your writing um, so it, we just feel like that's an excellent contribution I want to thank you for um, for the excellent writing we're really looking forward to the space opera obviously i can't wait for it um so where uh if people are just watching this can you tell them a little bit about where to find you where to follow you online that kind of thing sure 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 uh, i am a uh, very brand specific so just look for maurice broadus on twitter <laughs> instagram uh my website uh facebook uh is all, all maurice broadus if you see a reese broadus on any of those pages, know that that's my oldest son and he's probably trolling me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. We'll go look for that. That's going to be fun. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, you are pretty easy to find online. So uh, thank you very much for your time, for being our uh, our guest of honor here at, uh, at Multiverse for this year. We are we, we want to get you back down here to Atlanta yes. and uh, meet you and hang out in person, but we appreciate oh, you doing man. it virtually. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. Oh, we're going to have me. a great time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching and uh, go on and check out everything else that's going on at Multivirtual and we will see you later.